welcome everyone to this evening's uh, last lecture in this year's Noah Simon's lecture series. Um, if you had been here back in the uh, earlier days, such as 1953 when we started, I think you would have had, if I remember right, eight lectures on your on your calendar for this this uh, Menno Simons lecture series. So I think the people back then must have had more uh, open spaces on their calendars. Maybe the week was a little longer back in the 1950s than it is now. In any case, we've been uh, privileged to hear about uh, Rachel Waltner Gosen's research and uh, ongoing project. And we're uh, happy to uh, hear some more this evening. So, Rachel. Thanks, John. Good evening, and thank you for being part of this lecture series. In the last couple of days, this has been a rich setting for comments and questions and inquiry about historical and contemporary dimensions of LGBTQ leadership. And it's also been just very, very nice for me personally to be back on the Bethel campus and to see so many of my academic mentors, a number of whom are in the audience tonight, and my friends, and also to have members of my family here. Thank you all for, for your attendance and participation. Last night, we were looking at leaders who had been departing from Mennonite institutions. And this morning during the convocation session, we focused on individuals who have been arriving and retaining Mennonite identities as they navigate calls to ministry. Tonight, we'll begin with the observation that Mennonites within the two historically largest denominations in North America, Mennonite Church USA and Mennonite Church Canada, are moving in progressive directions. MC Canada, for example, recently completed a lengthy discernment process, which they called being a faithful church. And that yielded agreements not to expel congregations, testing the spirit, that's their language, testing the spirit of LGBTQ inclusion. On both sides of uh, these national borders, Canada and the US, progressive Mennonite congregations and institutions have been and continue to engage and attract LGBTQ members and leaders. And with these transformations, there have been denomination-wide reverberations. Tonight, I want to open with two reconciliation stories centered on the lives of Mennonite pastoral leaders and their communities. Following these profiles, I will offer some concluding observations about faith leaders who identify as sexual minorities in the historical moment in which we now find ourselves, as well as implications for the broader church in North America and beyond. As with the previous presentations in this series, we'll leave some time for questions and your comments. We begin with two reconciliation stories because throughout this oral history scholarship, I have wanted to highlight the perspectives of LGBTQ leaders in their own words. Only when we recognize the varieties in experiences of young and old, of cradle Mennonites and just joining Mennonites, of ministers and laity and students, do the legacies of LGBTQ exclusion over time come into focus? Michael Volbrecht, a colleague of mine at Washburn University, who is nearing the end of his Master of Divinity degree program at a seminary in Kansas City and who plans a ministerial career with the United Church of Christ, the UCC denomination, confirms this. He was formerly Catholic, and his journey toward ministry took an abrupt turn when he was expelled from a Catholic seminary for coming out as a gay man. 
Recently, he told me, I am especially grateful that your approach is based on the lived experiences of LGBTQ folk you're interviewing. We are not just statistics of a changing church, but individuals with both a sexual and religious identity. The first reconciliation story. Keith Schrag is age 80 and lives in Ames, Iowa. His father and his grandfather were Mennonite ministers in Ontario, Canada, and Keith had a strong sense after college of being called to ministry. He felt, this is my place, this is my essence, my being. Yet I had this strong, innate drive to connect in very intimate ways with men. In my sense of sexuality, I was quite alone. I did talk briefly in about 1958 with a counselor, a dean at Goshen College where I was a student then. That man did not judge me. He still seemed to respect me. I got married and went to seminary and I got affirmation as a pastor in spite of this thorn in the flesh that continued for decades. By the mid-1960s, he was struggling, he recalls, with how to get victory over my sin. Much later, after 25 years of marriage, he and his wife divorced. Both she and their children supported him in his ministerial career and as a gay man. During the 1980s, Keith Schrag's quest for a spiritual home led to engagement for a time with the American Friends Service Committee, where he found people embracing part of being a peace church and accepting of queer identity. He says, there was no conflict between the two, and I found that immeasurably helpful. He also found his way to the Brethren Mennonite Council for LGBT Interests, and he joined their board. But while pursuing ministry at the Ames Mennonite Fellowship in 1987, he ran into conflict with the Central District Conference, which held his ministerial credential. Asked at that time whether he believed that sexual contact between men was wrong, Keith replied that he could no longer consider this a sin and his ministerial credentials were not renewed. Central District Conference officials then informed him that he could not serve on a district-wide peace committee. At the time, Keith recalls thinking, for queer Mennonites like himself, there, quote, would be no more dialogue with the church. That became very clear. In the years that followed, he says, I was connected with many gay men, many in professions and also blue collar, and I was part of the Gay Men's Coalition of Des Moines. It was as difficult, and this is in the 1980s that he's referring to, it was as difficult to identify as a Christian as to identify as LGBT because so many of my male friends in those groups had also experienced pain and trauma. They couldn't understand why I would want to identify as a Christian. The reconciliation between Keith with Central District Conference took place more than a quarter century later, beginning with conversations at the fabulous, fierce, and sacred gathering in 2014 in Chicago, and that's actually uh, pictured here on the side where uh, Keith is singing in the blue shirt with, with others at that event. This was a celebratory event in 2014 for LGBTQ persons and allies that was sponsored by the Brethren Mennonite Council. There at this gathering in Chicago, he recalls, pastors Joel Miller of Columbus, Ohio, and Ron Adams of Madison, Wisconsin, became interested in my story. 
and becoming a part of reconciliation with the Central District Conference. He says, I had not been involved with the conference for many years, but now there came warm connections. It was powerful to me. It was a homecoming. There are so many friends that I have in that group. Regarding his own ministry and long ago lapsed credentials, he told me, quote, I am in leadership now, this is age 80, with the Ames Mennonite Fellowship. Yet I am not ready to be recognized as a pastor in the denomination. I'm no longer ready to fit into boxes. I don't need to hassle with the formality of being a respected minister. I worked hard to get that label for decades. I don't want that anymore. My basic orientation of Christian faith comes from the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew. Not judging, loving enemies, this has really resonated with me. I never expected to live to see the day we are now. I know we're not perfect in Midnight Church USA, but I think we can do better and I want to be part of that. I think we're making some good strides. In the midst of trauma, there's grace. The older I get, I see that. A second re reconciliation story, this one from Ontario, Canada. Shannon Newfelt, shown here third from left, grew up in Saskatchewan. She graduated from Canadian Mennonite Bible College, now Canadian Mennonite University in 1994 with degrees in music and theology. After three years of voluntary service in Hamilton, Ontario, she accepted a post as associate minister at Toronto United Mennonite Church. Within several years, she recalls, quote, I came out to myself after struggling a lot Things that feel easy now felt really hard then. I felt there had to be a lot of secrecy, a lot of silence. I really felt like I was caught. I had truth that I couldn't share. She continues, I couldn't live like that for very long. I was at a point in history where I saw some possibilities that I didn't have to lie in such secrecy. I was seeing tides beginning to shift. She came out deliberately over the next year and a half, first to her friends and her family, then to church leadership and to the Toronto congregation where she was working. I thought there was an open question, she remembers, whether I'd be able to keep my job. I hoped that this fairly educated, fairly progressive urban church in Toronto would be able to take a progressive stand. But after a year-long discernment process, which she felt got rushed to a too hasty conclusion, she in fact lost her job. A number of the people left the congregation during the conflict. Both people who had wanted her ministry there to continue and others who were angry and disappointed that the congregation was even considering questions, questions related to LGBTQ inclusion. It ended up, she recalls, being decided by a very close vote. In 2003, the congregation held a meeting to decide to settle three questions. First, church membership, can LGBT people be members? Second, lay leadership. Can LGBT people exercise leadership, including preaching? And third, pastoral leadership. Can LGBT people be in pastoral ministry? On the first two questions, those present voted affirmatively. On the third question, the one about pastoral leadership, which needed to pass with a two-thirds majority, the vote fell short by two votes. That was the end of Shannon's employment, an outcome she had not fully expected. 
It was devastating, she recalls. I'd lost my community. I felt the church was swept out from under me. There was a lot going on in 2003. I lost my job, a family crisis. I got married. Shannon and her partner eventually had two sons. For a time, their family migrated to the United Church of Canada denomination, and Shannon worked on a Master of Divinity degree. But over time, she says, the United Church didn't necessarily feel like home or where I was meant to be. In 2012, she and her partner decided to return to the Toronto United Mennonite Church where she had lost her pastoral position nearly a decade earlier. They were drawn back by the Mennonites' Christian education program for their children, the community, and the music. We decided to give it six months, she said, and reevaluate. She and her family are still there, in large part because she says there have been some pretty amazing attitude changes. Last fall, the congregation decided to join the Supportive Communities Network, and her experiences that she says many people really do get it in terms of what it means to be completely affirming. Other people are open to figuring it out. And over the past decade, she's developed a career with Kairos, an ecumenical organization across Canada that provides theological education and advocacy for people and peace and justice work. And so the picture you see here is part of her work with Kairos. The United Church denomination is involved in Kairos, as are Mennonites, Catholics, and three other denominations. By now, more than 15 years after her ouster from Toronto United Mennonite Church, she says, I'm in a pretty good place, and I hope my story causes movement to happen in the congregation and the conference so that future generations won't have to struggle so much. It's satisfying to know there's been change. This is a reconciliation story, she adds. I have preached once. It felt like a big deal. It was 11 or 12 years to the month that I was told I could not preach there. It felt like a coming around. I'll preach again next month on themes related to my justice work with Kairos. It feels good. This image comes from the 2014 Mennonite World Conference gathering in Pennsylvania. It's a picture of Pink Menno. It's an advocacy group for LGBTQ Mennonites. And you may recall that a year later in Kansas City, the delegate body of MCUSA voted to uphold MCUSA's membership guidelines and also passed a resolution calling for forbearance in responding to difference among congregations and conferences regarding LGBTQ inclusion. Scholar Stephanie Crable has documented Pink Menno's rise as an advocacy group that has pushed MCUSA, especially at the biennial conventions and also in other venues, toward inclusivity. Stephanie Crable rebukes Mennonite denominational processes as violent to LGBTQ individuals for undermining their humanity. And Crable heralds the pushback, not only of Pink Menno, but also inclusive pastors, a, a group of uh, pastors in the denomination, and other allies who strategize for full inclusion. Such con con uh, contestations between progressives and conservatives in Mennonite denominations resemble those in other faith traditions. The historian John D'Amelio reminds us that, quote, neither religion nor sexuality is a singular unchanging entity, therefore the relationship between the two is not a fixed one and changes over time. Over the past decade, Mennonite Church USA has struggled and lost scores of congregations as well as both large and small regional conferences. And we just heard about one additional one, Southeast Conference, this month. The conflicts accompanying these departures are to some extent over LGBTQ inclusion and also over other issues, including women in ministry leadership. The conferences and congregations that have departed MCUSA 
tend to be at the conservative end of the theological spectrum. One significant exception from an earlier period, nearly two decades ago, is Germantown Mennonite Church in North Philadelphia, which back in 2001 was expelled from Eastern District Conference of the General Conference Mennonite Church for its inclusive stance toward LGBTQ members. Germantown, which is the oldest Mennonite congregation in North America, had intended to become part of MCUSA at the time of the 2002 merger, but was formally disallowed from membership from the larger body. In the words of Germantown historian Richard Lichty, for, and this is a quote from Lichty, for being the kind of welcoming faith community the Germantown congregation feels called to be. Earlier this year, I interviewed two denominational officials with Mennonite Church USA who have since retired. Irvin Stutzman, who until this past spring served as the denomination's executive director, and Nancy Kaufman, denominational minister for more than seven years. Kaufman managed the denomination-wide call system for matching pastoral candidates with congregations and their search committees that are filling vacant positions for pastoral ministry. Regarding the denomination's experiences with polarization, Nancy Kaufman suggested that when there are major policy changes regarding the status of LGBTQ individuals, in her words, people need time to catch their breath. And for some in the denomination, the changers were coming fast and furious. In their minds, they're thinking, now we've got pastors who are disregarding the confession of faith, disregarding the membership guidelines which have been holding us together. At least we thought they were holding us together in many ways. And now suddenly a conference is considering credentialing an LGBTQ person for ministry. But in 2013, when Mountain State's Mennonite Conference moved to license Theta Good, a lesbian, and in 2015, when Eastern Mennonite University announced that it would change its non-discrimination policy to allow the hiring of married gay and lesbian faculty, theolo theologically conservative constituencies reacted by departing from MCUSA. In Kaufman's view, and I quote, I think those two things in and of themselves would have been earth shattering across the whole church but I think the fact that it came from two groups where it was not expected, mountain states rather than central district conference and Eastern Mennonite University, it did affect the conservatives. I think there would have been a little more space for everyone to breathe if it had come from central district and maybe Goshen College. Conservatives thought Eastern Mennonite was more in line with where the whole church was than Goshen College. So I think they were shocked that it happened and also shocked where it came from because that's not where people expected it to come from first. And that's the end of the quote there from Nancy Kaufman. Earlier this year, reflecting on conferences and congregations ongoing departures from Mennonite Church USA, former executive director Irvin Stutzman reflected I have been too optimistic about corporate Christian discernment. On the issue of the denomination's current call process, in which denominational officials send openly queer candidates applications only to conference ministers who request them, rather than to all conference ministers across MCUSA, Irvin Stutzman notes, quote, it's a polarizing thing. The way I see it now is that the current practice is a compromise from both sides. Anytime you have a compromise, you have an unstable situation and it will likely shift because I think inclusive pastors and others will press to the point where you have to have full inclusion in every way and I, I think if that happens, our overall denomination will indeed shrink to the size of the people who are willing to live with that which would be smaller than where we are right now. That's the end of the quote from Irvin Stutzman. He points out that the present trend of MCUSA becoming smaller 
and also more progressive in its practices is a different outcome from what he has observed in several other Protestant denominations. The Church of the Brethren, as well as the United Mennonite Church, he notes, have likewise struggled with questions of same-sex marriage and LGBTQ pastoral leadership. In those two denominations, he says, polarized ideological factions remain carrying out bitter battles over LGBTQ inclusion. In 2018, now, Policies regarding queer leaders seeking ministerial positions are no longer as restrictive as they once were. Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, AMBS, no longer denies Master of Divinity degrees to qualified candidates who are openly queer. Nor does Mennonite Church USA still refuse to process ministerial leadership information forms of queer candidates as a way of diverting them from the denominational hiring system. But these and other policy changes are very, very recent, signifying markers in a denomination that historically has excluded sexual minorities from leadership and still places substantial barriers before them. Reverberations within the International Development and Justice Agency Mennonite Central Committee reflect this. Individ individuals who identify as LGBTQ are considered by MCC for service positions if they are willing to abide by its celibacy policy and agree not to, quote, use MCC as a platform from which to advocate for same sex sexual relationships. And that's a quote from their policy. This past spring, prior to MCC's Canadian and US boards meeting in British Columbia, a petition and letter signed by hundreds of, cur and of current and former MCC workers and volunteers criticizing MCC's policy called on the agency to end its discriminatory qualification and barriers to service. Clearly, Mennonites are still a long way from embarking on a formal process of apology to LGBTQ persons for discrimination and harms inflicted. By contrast, the United Church of Canada is currently undertaking such a process and some allies of LGBTQ people among the Mennonites argue for such a move. One Kansas pastor, an ally, told me, in my ideal world, Mennonites will one day repent of the sins of homophobia. A queer student of theology comments, quote, when I think about the church, there's this caution now that in this moment, there have been a bunch of vocally conservative people who have left and there can be this era where we gain institutional change. And yet, where are we? Have we ultimately restructured the kinds of systems and have we dismantled the kinds of power structures that allowed queer people to disappear quietly and that still undermine the work of people of color? She adds, that's what I want to keep my eye on. That's central for me to live into this call for our church, for our Mennonite church. In terms of transnational developments, we can expect Mennonite World Conference to be far slower than other organizations, Christian peacemaker teams, for example, in addressing LGBTQ justice. If we consider Mennonite settings beyond North America, LGBTQ inclusion is essentially the norm, although not much discussed or theologized in parts of Europe. Mennonite churches in the Netherlands, as well as some throughout Germany, embrace queer pastoral leadership. Going forward, increased networking for LGBTQ advocacy in both Europe and in the global south is likely and likely to be contested potentially through the expansion of pink meno or in other 
culturally specific forms. Among U.S. Mennonites, the best known queer pastor leader is Theda Good, shown here at her ordination with supporters who attended this celebrative service in Denver. After a highly publicized discernment process in the Mountain States Mennonite Conference in 2013, she became the first openly LGBTQ Mennonite in the country to be licensed for ministry. And so there was national press coverage, although she herself did not seek the limelight. Since this photo was taken in 2016, she has moved on to serve at First Mennonite Church in Bluffton, Ohio. That is her current position. It's worth noting that more recent credentialing occasions of those following in her footsteps in Mennonite Church USA have evoked far less press attention than was the case for Theta Good. Recently licensed individuals who are openly queer include in Mountain States Mennonite Conference, Randy Spaulding and Erica Lee Simke, in Central District Conference, Mark Rupp, Caitlin Desjardins, and others, and in Allegheny Mennonite Conference, Michelle Burkholder. More LGBTQ leaders will surely follow. The narratives of these and other faith leaders expand notions of what it means to be Mennonite or Anabaptist. Often these labels are considered synonymous with church membership. For example, a Mennonite is someone who belongs to a Mennonite church. But for many of the individuals whose lives we've been considering, that may or may not be the case. Many of my interviewees who identify as LGBTQ continue to claim Mennonite and Anabaptist identity culturally, theologically, and by maintaining extended kin, friendship, and professional networks, even if they are serving in other denominations out of necessity or choice. And we've seen that some individuals are consciously layering denominational loyalties altogether, choosing two faith traditions and living them as complementary, Mennonite and Unitarian Universalist, for example, or Mennonite and Congregational. Jason Fry, a young doctoral student in ethics at Chicago Theological Seminary, whose life story I referenced this morning during convocation, puts it this way, quote, a gift of a lot of LGBT Mennonites is that we struggle with the question of what it means to be Mennonite, whereas straight Mennonites may not. In other words, for many Mennonites, the long-standing debates about inclusion of queer people have devolved into an in or out game in which some regard, which some regard as defining what it means to be Mennonite. Yet as we consider these faith leaders' lives, that dichotomy falls away. As these narratives attest, there are other ways of seeing Mennonite identity and other ways of seeing denominations which are redefined through processes of rejecting or embracing people. Valerie Claussen of Whitewater, Kansas, a parent, an ally, and an audience member at these Menno Simons lectures articulates what such a redefinition might look like. She says, the church should move in such a way that we love these talented, gifted people, and we should acknowledge our past history of making them outcasts. We'll conclude this evening by circling back to those two reconciliation stories with which we started. Mennonite elder Keith Schrag of Ames, Iowa, and the coming round story of Shannon Neufeld of Toronto. Taken together, the narratives of these and other pastoral leaders present a portrait of both shadow and light. The darker side is the hostility discrimination and pain that Mennonite lay and ministerial leaders have experienced as they've navigated church contexts. The harms have been personal, have touched family lives, 
and have disrupted congregations. The wounds inflected have been deep-seated. One of my interviewees, Annabeth Reshley, notes, quote, there are generations of people who have been lost to the Mennonite church. It's hard to wrap my mind around that. How do we do that justice? How do we honor that? She adds, we're in what seems like a remarkable, amazing time of so much change over the past decade, so it can be tempting to think about the progress without thinking about who has been harmed and who did the harming. Reshley names a historic problem for the Mennonite church. People identifying as queer have left the denomination in recent decades. Individuals of all ages and of varied sexual identities have left Mennonite spaces, in some cases accompanied by parents and other allies who cite the church's exclusionary policies and practices as alienating and as their cause for departure. And yet, there is a brighter side of this portrait and it's worthy of celebration. For many, staying Mennonite or identifying exclusively as Anabaptist is not necessarily a theological or vocational endpoint. Thoughtful, gifted leaders can and do thrive in Mennonite settings and in other faith communities while retaining aspects of Mennonite identity and claiming Anabaptist ideals. Their ecumenism offers lessons worth contemplating. Taken together, they illuminate patterns of commitment that push us to look at church history from the perspectives of those marginalized due to sexual orientation to see new possibilities and visions of Anabaptist Mennonite faith and life coming into view. Thank you. We have some time for questions. You mentioned that within the World Conference, uh, there was good acceptance in the European, amongst the European Mennonites. What, are, what about other continent Mennonites? such as Africa or South America or Asia? Those, those are histories yet to unfold. There really has not been LGBTQ activism toward inclusion to my knowledge in really robust ways in, in any part of the global south or on any of the continents outside Europe and North America. So these are, these are things yet to happen and will be the um, subject matter for all of us who care about uh, entities like Mennonite World Conference, um, church people who support entities like that, and scholars in, in years to come. So they, they will be facing this. Um, at this point, the activism for this kind of inclusion has really happened um, pretty much it's a European and, and North American story at this point. Thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> with, you've reflected on the experience within Mennonite Church USA, but as I interpret what you said, that is mainly the Anglo portion. What is happening within the Hispanic and the Afro-American groups within Mennonite Church USA? Is there any discussion along these lines? Are there any leaders emerging who are gay or lesbian uh, in those groups? And are they just a little bit behind Mennonite Church USA or, or where, are, where are they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't characterize any, anybody as being behind anybody else. Um, there are discussions ongoing and there certainly are uh, openly uh, vocal allies within uh, Hispanic and African-American uh, communities. 
it may be uh, somewhat difficult for pastoral leaders within uh, those communities to be as openly out as has been the case for, for many of the people that I spoke to come out of white context rather than those uh, communities of color. But those are conversations that are happening. They're happening within Mennonite Church USA. They're happening within, I know, the reference uh, council within Mennonite Church USA. Uh, there's certainly no unanimity of opinion um, I, I just read the recent uh, story in the Midnight World Review that came out uh, just last week about the Southeast uh, Conference, which is withdrawing uh, from Mennonite Church USA. There are many people of, of color in many of those congregations. The quote that I read in, in the news article was that, you know, people who are white did not all vote the same, and people who are of color did not all vote the same. So of course these are these are complicated questions, and um, we need to continue to watch these developments very closely. Um, of the people that I have approached to interview for my study, people that are are people of color who are seminary uh, trained, um, the people that I have visited with have said it, it is somewhat lonely to be a, a person who is queer and also a person of color because people may, may look at you as, as um, representing diversity and they may really embrace that you represent diversity because you're from a community of color, but the diversity in terms of being queer is not, not so broadly welcomed. So I, I hope for the opportunity to continue to engage with both allies and people from LGBTQ community. And as I mentioned last night, I don't really consider my scholarship on this topic to be done. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to present what I've done so far for the audiences here at Bethel, but am looking forward to um, connecting with all kinds of uh, individuals, both allies and people in the LGBTQ community going forward. Um, I'll throw a big one at you. Um, you haven't mentioned um, scriptural um, uh, um, bases of these people who are um, um, moving toward um, acceptance or leadership. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in my own experience, <coughs> um, the, the, the scriptural um, tennis match or combat that goes on around this issue mm -hmm. um, suggests that that theologians really are grappling with it uh, in, in, a, in a scriptural sense. So, mm -hmm. so what are you what do, what are you finding in, in in that dimension of this of this whole issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, for me, it has been uh, just. A blessing really to engage with a lot of theolo theologically minded individuals in this research and so I've tried to in my interviews I tried to ask them to reflect theologically about sexual identities and um, I yesterday I gave a, a sermon at Bethel College Mennonite Church during the worship service where I was able to uh, draw on the perspective of, of John Rempel uh, who used to be on the AMBS uh, faculty and, and now um, uh, is semi-retired and, and connected with theological institutions in Toronto, Canada. And um, he, he would speak, I think, only for himself. He wouldn't attempt to speak for other LGBTQ Mennonite uh, ministerial leaders. But uh, one of the things that he said to me is that uh, he grapples with why people continue to focus on issues of sexuality when there are so many needs in the world. And he said, on, around um, biblical interpretation, there are some things that we will not agree on. Why can't we accept that and continue to look where we have commonalities on so many other issues? So that's, that's one little you know, insight from John Rempel. Um, another extremely helpful resource that I bumped into in my research very early on 
um, was a, a documentary that was made two years ago called The Listening Church. And if any of you are taking notes, I would just commend this resource to you. It, it was put together by Irma Fast Duick, uh, who is a theologian in Canada with some of her colleagues. And what they did was to go across um, all the provinces that have Mennonite churches in Canada and interview uh, queer people Mennonite church members and filmed them centered in the meeting houses, it, sitting in the sanctuaries. And they just simply asked these individuals several questions about um, what calls you to be part of a Mennonite church and what is your hope for a Mennonite church? Will you reflect theologically? And so they filmed these many a uh, variety of ages and variety of you know people's occupations, but they are they are centered in the sanctuaries of the churches, reflecting. And it's not a long video, and it's it's also free. It's just online. All you have to do is is Google the Listening Church, and this pops up, and you can watch it. It's it's a wonderful half an hour of hearing sort of many people respond, not always with scriptural, you know, verse and chapter but they are reflecting theologically based on their understandings of, of being Christian. So that, that's just a resource that, that I commend. And I think I'll leave it with that. Um, John. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, today in the paper, I read that there's an ongoing item that is supposed to come out an agreement across all government agencies on a definition of gender that will be applied for Title IX and all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. How do we work with that? I mean, it, it sounds as if it's going to be the, mm -hmm. you know, the gender that you are identified with mm -hmm. at birth is what they're planning for. How do we go with that? Yeah, uh, we've been focusing in the Minno Simons lectures here on work to be done in the church, haven't we? But you're so right to point out there's work to be done in the public square. Um, and so I, you know, we all have to use exercise our political muscles, such as it may be. Um, as people who write letters and people who advocate and people who vote um, to let our public officials know where we stand on on that kind of um, you know power uh, turn yeah thank you I noticed as you've spoken the, the two times I've heard you that you have mentioned the words harm mm -hmm. and violence mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, how these people that have been able to circle their way back or find their way in another denomination mm -hmm. have um, reconciled the Anabaptist tenet of peacemaking with being extra extricated from the church or being uh, dismissed in some way. Mm -hmm. So have you, do you have some insight in how, how some people have responded to that dichotomy? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, for each individual person that I interviewed, that <laughs> the answer might be different to that. I mean, that is a very that's a very personal kind of a um, coming to reckoning that one has if one still embraces Anabaptist Mennonite theology. I I will cite um, a scholar in Winnipeg, Alicia Duick Reed, who answered that question by completely leaving. Christianity. She does not. She does not profess Christianity anymore. She didn't just leave her Mennonite and a Baptist route. She left Christianity. Um, she is the outlier. She is the only person I interviewed that has taken that route as as a response to the kinds of question you're posing. Um, many of the people I talk to find that this is sort of ongoing work 
um, that they will struggle with or will engage in their in their congregation, in their community, whether it is Mennonite or whether it is a, a uh, you know a different uh, faith tradition, um, and find many ways to work at peace and justice, recognizing that the the harms we've talked about and the violence that has been done has not really been redressed. And that's why I think this is an interesting notion that some faith traditions have seized, like I mentioned here toward the end of my talk tonight, United Church of Canada, the entire denomination is now going through a process of um, coming to what will be formal apology and attempt to redress the harms done to LGBT people in, in past decades. Um, and so that I, I lift that up as one model of what one faith tradition, and some of the folks that I've interviewed, including some that I have featured in these talks, are in that uh, Canadian denomination. Uh, the Unitarian Universalists, uh, which we're a little more familiar with here in the United States, um, have also been working at that. That is also a platform uh, for the UUs. I, I, I do believe Mennonites are really far, really far from taking a step like that to try to have a you know fully uh, engaged process in coming to try to redress uh, these harms. But other faith traditions are doing it. And so that's why I think it's been, for me, really um, helpful to try to consider these questions from a, a trans trans-denominational standpoint, not just only look at how Mennonites have been handling this, but try to understand from some other traditions in, as well. And um, I did make a really quick reference uh, in one of these lectures also to Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism also has grappled with this in, in a quite a progressive uh, way to, to try to understand how have people in that tradition been harmed also who are LGBTQ. So yeah, thanks, Yael. Was Eastern Mennonite, excuse me, was Eastern Mennonite University actually the first school to, to take that policy? Eastern Mennonite and Goshen also were working at that about the same time. And whether one was just slightly before the other, um, I'm not sure. When, when uh, Nancy Kaufman was, was uh, being interviewed, she, she, I think, was lifting up EMU because it, it, in her mind, it was what conservatives didn't expect to happen there in the way that it did. Although EMU, of course, had been through some years of um, a really pretty intense uh, administratively and also grassroots uh, driven effort to decide what to do about hiring faculty and, and staff that are in uh, LGBTQ. Didn't religion. Bethel have that policy several years before? Bethel College, as far as I know, has been open for a very long time to, to faculty. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it would be good if Kaufman would not say EMU was the first. <laughs> But, but I, I'm not sure that when it happened, I, well, we need to talk to the historians at Bethel Gym and find out the, the skinny on this. Um, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think what, what uh, Nancy Coffin was saying was it was a, a highly publicized decision with EMU. I'm not sure Bethel's decision was ever highly, highly publicized. So there may be some difference there in terms of how constituents related and also different constituencies, of course. The, I think the difference with EMU was that they announced a public engagement with the church about making that policy change. And that is probably what distinguished them. I don't think Bethel ever did that. But right. they invited right. a discernment process with, uh, with the congregations in Virginia Mennonite Conference about that mm -hmm. and their alumni. Mm -hmm. So they, I, and I think that, uh, that relates to the special uh, the relationship that EMU had had with the church from the very beginning. So that's right. what made it so public. That's right. Yeah, thank you, Patty, for the clarification. That's great. Appreciate it. Uh, excuse me, I don't want to be inappropriate here, but 
last, no, maybe about 18 months ago at convention, um, one of the delegates at a table near mine spoke publicly about the physical aspects, the, the physical touch. She, she referred to, nobody's going to tell me who my animal body can love. And it's, it, it struck me in a way that nothing else, no other comment struck me because I can fully understand the need for spiritual companionship, emotional support and companionship. Um, I, have, I have absolutely no problem with complete inclusion at all levels of the church, but that comment really struck me. And I'm curious if, if in speaking with all these Mennonite leaders, if the physical nature of love ever entered the conversation. I, I actually, um, earlier in, in uh, tonight's uh, presentation, speaking about Keith Schrag, did have a quote from him in which he talked about, even back in the 1950s, as he felt very much called to become a Mennonite minister like his grandfather and his father, he said, I also had this deep, intense yearning uh, to connect with men in very intimate ways. So there are different, diff different ways in which people articulate that. So I'm, there I'm quoting Keith. Other people would have different ways of addressing that. Well, there'd probably be dif different ways of interpreting it, right? I hope I can make a second comment. Um, those of us who have been in denominational leadership have, find our, have found ourselves in very difficult positions. I wonder, with all the interviews that you have had, what counsel would you give to those who are in leadership positions where they have personal feelings and convictions but who also have to listen to people who are on both sides of this kind of issue. What counsel would you give growing out of your interviews and your studies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think you're already there. If, if you and your colleagues are doing a lot of listening to people on both sides, that is, that's just hugely important, and you need to keep doing that, and anybody who is moving into leadership needs to really um, be attentive uh, to listening. I think that if, if that question was put to many of the people that I interviewed in this project, um, one of the th responses that they would pr quickly come up with to that question is um, that denominational leaders, conference leaders, should not only gnash their teeth and be worried about conservatives being alienated and leaving, <laughs> but that there is a whole history, and I, I have lifted up the history here, of course, but that a lot of people just really haven't known much about that for generations, people have left the church because people who were sexual minorities really were not welcome here. And so also as you're listening to people on both sides to, to, to know that and to have that as also an undergirding concern. I apologize if you covered this in earlier lectures, but um, what impact, if any, does legalized gay marriage have now on the people that you interviewed or on the church? The people I interviewed thought it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and many of them uh, got married either, in, either prior to the Supreme Court decision, you know, three years ago, there were, there were individual states that were allowing 
uh, same-sex marriage prior to that. Um, so actually, many of the people I interviewed are legally married um, to the people they love, and they are so grateful that that is, is, has been made possible by uh, legislative and by, by court decision. Um, I didn't know until I started this research that that actually happened in Canada 10 years in terms of a, a whole countrywide uh, mandate that same-sex became legal in Canada 10 years before it became legal here by the, our U.S. Supreme Court decision just a few years ago. Um, yeah, these are people who want to, um, you know, love who they love and they want to raise children with their partners and they would say we're not really any different from anybody else in most ways, you know. So I, they, they have welcomed that and, and um, to the extent that churches have been able to um, be the places where they could speak those commitments and also you know, worship with their families and to raise their children. They are they are grateful for those for those spaces. Okay, um, if you want to keep the conversation going, we're going to have an opportunity to do that. So, um, a couple quick announcements. We're going to have a reception just outside the auditorium, uh, following the address, and that will be an opportunity to, to uh, if you have any other questions for Rachel. And then also, while I've got you here, I want to invite you all to next year's Menno Simons lecture series. The topic is going to be NCC and Alan F. Weaver is going to be here. So join me in thanking Rachel. There's cookies enough for everybody. If you leave without one, it's your own fault. <laughs>